Welcome back. In the last mini lecture, I talked primarily uh, about the Magna Carta. And with the Magna Carta, we get a recognition that there is a independent uh, legislature and aristocracy that has certain rights. The significance of constitutionalism, that there were restraints on the political power uh, of the most powerful, in this case, the monarch, that that contract between the landed aristocrats and the king was honored uh, without interruption uh, for almost 400 years. And uh, in this particular case, it's not a modern democratic document. It is not an idealistic document, but it is a very practical document uh, that became uh, institutionalized almost from the very beginning. Now that same century, the 13th century, that the Magna Carta uh, becomes uh, drafted, signed by King John, uh, the Parliament begins. And of course the Parliament uh, is the legislature uh, in Britain. Uh, today there are two chambers, the House of Commons, the House of Lords, the dominant one, the one with almost all of the power is the House of Commons. Uh, the House of Lords today is uh, is, is a minor uh, a minor chamber. It is far less powerful. It has some delaying abilities. But in essence, if the House of Commons wants to pass something, uh, they are supreme. Uh, in fact, in the United States, we have constitutional supremacy. In Britain, we have parliamentary supremacy. So it's intriguing to me that when the first parliament was convened uh, in 1265, it was seen as an extension of the king's powers. The king was, in essence, trying to use the parliament to raise revenue, to raise manpower, to fight for claims of the crown, especially uh, on the continent. And so the aristocrats uh, were a mechanism of raising manpower, the knights, uh, money from the merchants to go off and fight these wars. So the king initially believed that he was using this new legislature, the parliament, to raise revenue for the crown. And of course, eventually what happens uh, is that uh, the aristocrats become increasingly more powerful. Parliament becomes increasingly more independent. I didn't write it down in the notes, but the way that I would put it uh, is that each time the king went to the aristocrats for money and manpower, the aristocrats became a little bit more powerful in the king uh, a bit weaker. So I concluded the last mini lecture by talking about how uh, the knights and the merchants that I called the burghers formed the lower house, which became known as the House of Commons. Uh, the House of Commons, as I pointed out, is a misnomer because in reality, originally the House of Commons only represented the elites, those that were locally powerful and those that were very wealthy. Now, eventually, a leader of the House of Commons became kind of a personal representative to the king and was given the title of speaker. And I want to make a comment here because the speaker of the House of Commons is very different than the speaker of the House of Representatives in the United States. In the United States, the Speaker of the House is the leader of the majority party, is the single most powerful representative in either House of Congress. In Britain, the Speaker of the House is supposed to be an impartial referee. The Speaker of the House is there to manage time between the parties to manage floor debate. And the speaker cannot vote uh, unless there is a tie in the House of Commons, which is very, very rare. I'm trying to remember the number off the top of my head, but in the, in the history of the House of Commons, the speaker 
uh, has voted, uh, I don't know, some 49 times, something like that. And I'll look up the exact number and give it to you later. But uh, it has not occurred uh, for almost 30 years. The speaker has not cast a vote. The nobles and churchmen formed the upper house, which became known as the House of Lords. And for us in America, this is where we got the notion of bicameralism. We have a two-house legislature, the House and the Senate. We call the House of Representatives the lower house. And we stole this from the British who referred to the House of Commons as the lower house, right? The idea was that uh, the House of Lords was an aristocratic chamber. Uh, for, for many, it was something that you inherited. It was a birthright, if you will. The House of Commons were closer to the people, therefore they were lower. At least that was the notion in Britain. And in the United States, we did the same thing. Originally in the United States, when the Constitution was first drafted, only the House of Representatives was directly elected by the people. The Senate was originally selected by state legislatures, so it was removed from the direct power of the people, and therefore it was called the Upper House. So the House of Representatives, the Lower House, because it was elected by the people, the upper house, the Senate, because it was not directly elected by the people. We stole this two house legislature and we stole the terms upper and lower house from the British with the House of Commons and the House of Lords. So there is another uh, takeaway uh, in terms of things that we stole from the British. I told you the notion of a sheriff. Uh, we stole that uh, as well from the British. Now, Ross can leave some things out in this section, so I just want to add a few things uh, for you to think about. Uh, the House of Commons was not really a distinct entity until Henry VIII in the 16th century. Uh, before Henry VIII, and of course Henry VIII uh, is an early 16th century monarch, uh, before Henry VIII, it was the lords that served as the major pool from which the Tudor monarchs, and in this case, I would be talking about Henry VII, who was Henry VIII's father. Uh, eventually, and this is a century and a quarter after Henry VIII dies, eventually the House of Commons becomes more powerful. Some would say really becomes the leading uh, branch of British government by basing its power on the requirement that it originate tax measures. Now notice I put in the notes, here is another place where the U.S. Constitution stole from the British, right? If you look at the Constitution, the Constitution says that the lower house, the, house, the U.S. House of Representatives, must originate all money or tax bills. So just as in Britain, the House of Commons is responsible and was responsible starting in the 1670s for originating tax revenues and money bills, uh, we put that in our Constitution. So uh, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that the United States and Britain are seen as really two completely different models of government for democracies uh, to borrow ideas from. And the point is that even though Britain is a parliamentary system and the United States is a presidential system, the United States has taken and borrowed a lot of concepts from the British. And I'm giving you just uh, a few examples of that. Now, there were several things that led to the Tudor era and, and how and why there was a brief spike in executive power. The Tudors were really the high water mark of monarchical power uh, in Britain. And there were some things that strengthened these strong monarchs. 
one I mentioned, I won't test you on the Wars of the Roses. I'm just mentioning it. Uh, the Wars of the Roses lasted for 30 years from 1455 to 1485. Uh, it created a tremendous uh, instability. There were four royal changes during that period. Uh, these wars uh, weakened the nobility who looked to the House of Commons to legitimize their policies, which began really this very slow uh, diminishment uh, in the power of the lords. And in fact, by the 1670s, the lords were denied the power to amend a tax, and only the commons could originate bills that involved expenditures. Now, there were some other things that occurred that are intriguing to me that Roskin does not mention. Uh, and one of them that stands out to me is that by the latter 14th century, monarchs were really serving at the pleasure of the parliament. And I'll give you an example uh, that I mentioned in the notes. Uh, King Richard II was deposed by the parliament in 1399 and replaced with Henry IV. It's not an important fact for test purposes, but this really reinforces a point made a couple of lectures ago. So Henry IV becomes King of England in 1399, and Henry was the first English king since the Norman Conquest who spoke English as his first language. So from 1066, when William the Conqueror became King of England until 1399, so that's over 300 years, every other British monarch spoke French, which to me is very, very intriguing. Now we're gonna see a shift. I've been talking about how and why the aristocrats became more powerful. But uh, there was an attempt, especially by Henry VII, I'll talk about him in the next lecture, uh, to um, kind of take some power back from Parliament. And the way that Henry VII tried to do this, of course, was to not convene Parliament. If they're not in session, if they're not consulting, uh, then, then the king has a freer hand. But the Parliament is going to get a very, very unexpected ally. In fact, it is Henry VII's son, Henry VIII, probably the early English king you are most familiar with, most people know Henry VIII as uh, a, a king that had a problem with the ladies in his life. He uh, ended up getting married six times. He beheaded two of them. But Henry VIII is going to enhance the power of the parliament because he needs them as an ally. And he needs them as an ally because Henry VIII is going to go to war with the Catholic Church. In our next mini lecture, we're going to talk about how and why Henry VIII wanted a divorce from a Spanish princess who Henry VIII married, Catherine of Aragon. Of course, you know the story. Catherine had one male child, but he died as a child. And in his uh, quest to have a male heir for dynastic reasons, he sought a divorce. The Catholic Church said no. Henry could not take the church on by himself. So he went to the Parliament and said, let's get rid of the Catholic Church. Let's create a new church, a Church of England under state control. And the Parliament said, well, okay, if, if you go public, and you declare us your equal. And we'll find out how and why Henry VIII was willing to make Parliament his co-equal in the next mini-lecture. Have a wonderful day. See you soon.